These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. You may not know it, but today is the Mesopotamian New Year's Festival. The Mesopotamians, like many ancient cultures, reckon the start of the new year not in winter like we do today, but around the start of spring, which would have been the harvest time in the Mesopotamian plains. The Akatu Festival was thus both a New Year's party and a harvest festival, a two-in-one of culturally significant celebrations that makes Akitu perhaps the biggest date on the calendar of the ancient Near East. And because of how significant it is, the festival ended up stretching out over 12 whole days, with multiple occasions for general merriment, quite a lot of religious piety, and plenty of storytelling for education and entertainment. A quick programming note before we really get into it, though. We were going to be looking at some really fun newsy texts this week, but I remembered at the last minute that it is, in fact, the most important holiday of the Mesopotamian calendar, and I didn't want to miss it. So we'll be looking at the great criminal conspiracy of newsy next episode, a bit of true crime that I think will be pretty fun. However, that episode may or may not be coming next week because while all ancient Mesopotamians will be spending this week in celebration, I will be spending it traveling for my job, which includes some mandatory COVID quarantines, so I may or may not be able to upload the next episode, which may mean that the next episode comes in two weeks unless I get very lucky with some easy-to-access and safe Wi-Fi spots. Anyway, the official start of the Akatu holiday is on the first day of the Ara Nisanu, which means, fittingly enough, the month of beginning. In fact, the modern Jewish calendar still has a month of Nisan, which in religious figuring is still the first month of the year. Now, we do typically think of the Jewish calendar as starting with their New Year festival of Rosh Hashanah in the fall. And certainly that's true, but the Jews adapted their own lunar calendar to the Babylonian one during the Babylonian captivity period, and to this day maintain a separate religious and civil counting of the months. This, as you might imagine, can at times get a bit complex, and unless you're trying to figure out the date of Passover from biblical first principles, it's mostly just an interesting bit of trivia. Now, interestingly as well, just as the Jews have two New Years, so did the Babylonians, though much less is known about the August festival of Tashritu. However, the correspondence between the Babylonian and Jewish calendars means that we can figure out the dates of the Akadu festival quite definitively, just by referencing a Jewish calendar and checking the first month of Nisan until the 12th. If you're listening to this on the day it comes out, which by the modern calendar should be March 17th, 2021, then know that it is also the 4th of Nisan, year 5781 by the Jewish calendar, and hence a few days into the start of the Babylonian New Year. Which, as a side note, brings up the interesting question of what year is it by the Mesopotamian calendar system? Now, there's no objective answer to this, because unlike Western society, the Mesopotamians did not count years from a fixed starting point. Indeed, in the early periods, as we've seen, they didn't count years at all, but instead described each year as the year that something happened, perhaps the year that a king took the throne, or perhaps the year that a king finished a canal project, or the year that a king defeated an enemy. By the time we get to the Kassite period, the Babylonians have moved to the somewhat simpler, though sadly less historically informative, method of counting from the reign of each king. So a particular year might be the second or eighth or twelfth year or whatever of a particular king's reign. This would continue until the end of Babylonian civilization, when the Persians, Greeks, and Romans would number years in similar though culturally specific ways. It would be the Muslims who would end this system, replacing it with a count from the year that the prophet Muhammad went to Medina. We could, if being particularly insistent, say that the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, began his reign in 556 BCE and was never replaced by another valid king. So, by that, we're in year 2577 of the reign of Nabonidus. 
We could follow traditions more closely by noting that the current ruler of Mesopotamia, Iraqi President Barham Saleh, has been in power since 2018, making this the dawn of year four of his rule. We could also follow the Sumerian kings list and count from the beginning of the world. However, this puts the first historically attested king on this list, Enma Bargesi, at the year 257,750, making this the dawn of year 263,621 since the creation of the world, or thereabouts if I did the math right. As a fourth alternative, we could follow the original Sumerian system of naming the years, which were, by necessity, since you name it at the start of the year, named by the major event of the previous year, which would pretty clearly make this the year in which a disease spread to the four corners of the universe, or something of that nature. Anyway, whatever year it was yesterday, know that today is the start of a new one. The Akadu festival shifts from year to year, being based on the lunar calendar while we use a solar calendar. Last year it began on March 30th, next year it will begin on April 5th. But whatever specific solar calendar day it falls on, reconstructing the Akatu festival involves a big problem. The festival took place in many different cities and nations over thousands of years, and indeed some of our best evidence for the festival takes place hundreds of years after the end of Babylon, during the Seleucid Empire, when the Greek successors of Alexander the Great ruled over Mesopotamia. And so, I'm going to read through the 12 days of Akitu, looking at events taking place every day as if it was one great festival. But we should always keep in mind that this is a mishmash of sources, and it's quite likely that Akitu looked different in different times and places. Additionally, I myself am not a follower of the Mesopotamian polytheistic religion. However, I have gotten feedback and encountered a number of neo-pagans since beginning my show, and it seems that the neo-pagan community always has questions about how to adapt ancient practice to fit into a modern context. And so as I go along with the account of the festival, I'll be adding my own thoughts for how a modern enthusiast or worshipper might go about bringing this festival into the modern day. As of today, assuming you are listening on release day, we're in the fourth day of the Akatu Festival. But don't worry, because even though you may have missed a bit, there is some dispute as to whether the common folks of Babylon would have actually done anything for these three days, since our documentation is focused solely on the activities of the king. There are some indications that, far from being a time of celebration, these first few days of the year were days of anxiety and misery, with ritual mourning occurring within the city. Each day, in anticipation of the rituals to come on the following days, the high priest of Marduk within the Esagila temple in Babylon would offer the following prayer in pious humility, along with likely a table full of ceremonial offerings. Lord, without peer in thy wrath, Lord, gracious King, Lord of the lands, who made salvation for the great gods. Lord, who throwest down the strong by his glance. Lord of kings, light of men, who does apportion destinies. O Lord, Babylon is thy seat, Borsippa thy crown. The wide heavens are thy body. Within thine arms thou take the strong. Within thy glance Thou grantest them grace. Make them see light, so that they proclaim thy power. Lord of the lands, light of the Igigi, who pronounced blessings, who would not proclaim you in your power? Who would not speak of your majesty, praise your dominion? Lord of the lands, who lives in Eudel, who takes the fallen by the hand, have pity on your city Babylon. Turn thy face towards Esagila thy temple. Give freedom to them that dwell in Babylon, your wards. Now there are a few words missing from this prayer, damaged in the tablet, but generally it's remarkably complete and in good shape. For those considering their own Akadu festival, I see no reason why you couldn't say this prayer today to open the festival. 
It is a prayer to Marduk because nearly all of our good documentation comes from Babylon, but you can either say this prayer to Marduk or make a prayer to your own personal god. Or you could pray to your city and patron god, or perhaps nation and national god, since that is closer to the modern paradigm of the ancient communities. In any case, whether you pray to Marduk or to some other great god, you should accompany that in these somber days with prayers to your personal god. Every single individual in ancient Mesopotamia would have had his own personal relationship with a singular, usually lesser deity, who would serve as their guardian angel of sorts. Now, following the theme of the days of mourning preceding the festival itself, it might be good to contemplate the times that you have fallen short of what your God wants of you with this late Bronze Age prayer to a generic personal God, likely meant for the general worshiper to meditate on his personal relationship with his deity. Be it offense, crime, iniquity, or sin, I have offended my God. I have sinned against my goddess. I have indeed perpetrated all my crimes, all my sins, all my iniquities. I gave my word, then changed it. I was trusted, but did not deliver. I did unseemly deeds. I said something harmful. I repeated what should not be spoken of. Harmful speech was on my lips. I was ignorant. I went too far. Absolve me, my God. Let my iniquities be dissolved. Transmute my sins into good deeds for the future. Who is there who is guilty of no sin against his God? Which is he who has kept a commandment forever? All human beings there are harbor sin. I, your servant, have committed every sin. I stood before you, but I spoke falsehood. I uttered lies, I indulged crimes, I spoke harmful words, you know what they are. I committed an abomination against the God who created me. I acted sacrilegiously, I kept on doing evil. I envied your vast possessions, I yearned for your precious silver, I lifted my own hand to touch what should not be touched. I entered the temple without being pure. I committed one terrible outrage after another against you. I went beyond your limits of what was offensive to you. I cursed your divinity in the rage of my heart. I have persisted in every sort of crime. I kept on going as I liked and incurred iniquity. It is enough, O oh my God. Let your heart be calmed. May the goddess who grew angry be pacified completely. Dissolve the ire you harbored in your heart. May your innermost self, which I swore by, be reconciled with me. Though my crimes are numerous, clear my debt. Though my iniquities be sevenfold, let your heart be calmed. Though my sins be numerous, show great mercy and cleanse me. O oh my God, I am exhausted. Grasp my hand from the ground and hold up my head. Save my life. Let the day be joyful for the shepherds of the people. Let me sing of you. Let me praise your divinity. Let me sound your praises to the numerous peoples. Now, it is interesting to consider how little that prayer would need to be changed to be a perfectly typical prayer of Christian worship, for people have the same failings, the same concerns, and the same sins today as they've had for the last 5,000 years. Indeed, for those of you who dislike the modern polytheist movement and may have skipped over that prayer, the full text of all of these prayers is being posted up on the post for this episode at oldeststories.net. It is a bad little prayer for most faith traditions, not just for the occasion of Akitu, but also for general purposes. Anyway, the exact offerings that would have accompanied either of these prayers have been lost time, but they may have included on the poorer end beer, barley, and incense, and most significantly in the major temples, animal sacrifices of sheep and cattle. 
Day three would see the construction of two little puppets of wood, inlaid with perhaps gold and gems if you're wealthy, for use on the sixth day. If you make tiny puppets of wood, dress them up in tiny clothes. That would be a good, fun little activity. The fourth day is where the party really gets started. In fact, there are many people who don't consider the first three days to really be part of the festival at all, and in older Sumerian texts, such as the fragmentary account of the Akatu at Ur, which celebrated the moon god Nana, these don't appear to contain the preparatory days. Which is good, because if you're listening on the day this episode comes out, then you're just in time for the real important parts of the festival. This is the day when the people would start to take off from work, to feast and party and undertake religious observance. In Babylon, the high priest of Marduk's temple would announce the beginning of the new year. The king of Babylon would travel out of the city to a town just a bit south, Borsippa, where a great temple of the god Nabu was located. Nabu was the son of Marduk, an important god in his own right in the later Babylonian period, though in other traditions the kings of other cities would visit temples relevant to their local gods. Regardless of the holy site the king visited, night four was critical. Here is where the famous Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, would be recited each year. For a modern practitioner, there are many copies of the full text that can be found online, and one is linked in the show notes at oldeststories.net. Or, you could scroll down your podcast feed to episode 29, where I have an episode wholly devoted to retelling the ancient myth. For those who don't know or don't remember the myth, the Enuma Elish is about the creation of the Earth and its near destruction in the great heavenly war which raged in the early days. Symbolically, the entire Agadu festival is devoted to the symbolic death of the old year and the birth of the new, and the myth of the destruction of the old order and renewal of the new was believed to be, in a sense, reenacted at this time up in the very heavens every year. This is why the preceding days have been so anxious. Not only are the people considering the blessings that they've received in the previous year and their own failings, they're also worried about the cosmic battle, which is even now taking place, as genuinely worried about the possible destruction of the Earth as perhaps modern apocalyptic cults are. Day 5 opens with a ceremony surrounding the king and the god Marduk. The king accompanies the god Nabu, or at least the cult statue of Nabu, which for polytheists is the same thing, back to the city of Babylon. The god would sit, presumably under reverent guard, outside the gates of the city, while the king entered into the holiest chambers of Marduk's Esagila temple. In the more astronomically focused later Babylonian tradition, there was a prayer that went, the white star which brings omens to the world is my lord, my lord be at peace. The star good which causes rain is my lord, my lord be at peace. My star Gena, star of law and order, is my lord, my lord be at peace. These particular astronomical bodies correspond to what we would call Jupiter, Mercury, and Saturn, though of course they have no relation to the Roman gods for whom we have those planets named after nowadays. And Mesopotamian prior to the very late period was much less focused on astronomical signs, and it's likely that the gods would have all been invoked in other ways. In any case, the king would then be stripped of his royal mace, crown, and scepter, possibly also some or all of his clothes, and he and the temple would be ritually purified and prayed over. Then the king would kneel before Marduk, with both the cult statue and Marduk's high priest in attendance, and he would make a heartfelt negative confession, swearing to the high god that he had not sinned. An example text from a very late period reads, I have not sinned, O Lord of the lands. I have not been negligent regarding thy divinity. I have not destroyed Babylon. It then continued on, but we've lost parts of it, and the high priest would respond in Marduk's name, Do not fear. What Marduk has spoken will come to pass. He will hear your prayer. He will increase your dominion and heighten your royalty. 
having given his confession, the king would be slapped hard in the face. It would have to be so hard as to draw tears from the king's eyes. The more tears, the more sincere it was, and the better indication of the king's faith. What this means exactly is debated among scholars. There are some who think that this negative confession is a much later innovation, one meant principally for the foreign rulers of Babylon, and was not part of the more ancient ceremony under earlier native rulers. However, others point to the fact that there were, in fact, kings of Babylon who gave similar negative confessions, and this may have been an ancient tradition of submission before the gods. Indeed, nearly every king presented himself as publicly submissive before the gods and as holding their kingship in trust from the gods. For the people of Babylon, the sad part of the festival peaks at this point, and it's likely that more rites of penance, humility, and devotion to the gods were undertaken here. Tonight will be the most dangerous night of the year, for Marduk will be gone from the heavens and gone from the earth, gone off to fight his yearly battle in the sky. While Marduk is gone, the priests of Esagila go all around the temple with censers of burning incense, swinging the smoke around and purifying the temple. Symbolically, they're burning down the temple, and they have to carefully clean every inch of it back as they symbolically rebuild the temple before the god gets back so that he has a new and clean temple to return to. Indeed, it's possible that some of the classical laments were sung at this point, either in the temple or even in the streets, such as the laments for Ur, Sumer, Nippur, or perhaps other laments that have not survived to this day. The memory of destruction, which resulted from the absence of the gods, was well known throughout Mesopotamian civilization, and the anxiety in the streets was almost certainly very real. However, at the conclusion of the evening ceremony in which the king is humiliated, he receives a glorious oracle from the gods, confirming his right to rule. The high priest then hands the king back his royal mace and scepter, perhaps also his clothes, for, as I said, he may have been fully or partially nude for this, and then they pray over and probably sacrifice a white bull in thanksgiving. For the modern worshipper, a similar recognition of Marduk's absence is appropriate, accompanied with a stern asking of yourself if you've truly done what the gods desire of you in the past year. Remember, the most powerful king of Mesopotamia would have his failures literally slapped into him so hard that it would draw tears. If you can go through this process and are unaffected, then perhaps you're standing too proud before your god. After a night in which the gods are absent from their temples, missing from the very earth, with people going around town asking where the gods were, the next day would begin before dawn. In the streets, people pl bang drums, play instruments, scream and clap and wail, generally making as much noise as possible, all the way until dawn breaks over the horizon. The entire world is in chaos, and the screaming in the streets symbolizes this. Nabu, son of Marduk, who has been sitting outside the city of Babylon, enters now at dawn, alongside some of the other minor gods, and he begins to make a circuit of the temples in the city, stopping at each and starting to battle the evil forces that surrounded the temple. The puppets, which had been made on the third day, were sacrificed here on the sixth, though it isn't completely clear what this represents. It could be the sins of the previous year. It could be lesser gods perishing in the battle, or it could be a burnt offering of the worshipper himself, and perhaps his family, symbolically killed with the death of the doll to offer his very life, symbolically of course, to the god. For the modern practitioner, this is probably the most important part of the ceremony, and though a massive parade in the streets is likely out of the question, something loud symbolizing the chaos and conflicts of the day is appropriate here. For the ancients, though the danger had yet to pass, the spectacle of following Nabu and his companion gods around the city to witness battle after battle likely turned the fear into something more of a frenzy. 
offerings would be ignored on this day so long as the gods were absent. But as the lesser gods were restored to their life, having been cleaned very well while they were out, offerings would be made for their return. A fitting prayer for this night is something like this example from the late Bronze Age. O oh my God, my Lord who created my life, guardian of my life, producer of my progeny, O oh angry God, may your heart be calmed. O oh angry goddess, be reconciled with me. Who knows where you dwell, O oh my God? Never have I seen your pure standing place or sleeping chamber. I'm constantly in great distress. O oh my God, where are you? You who have been angry with me, turn towards me. Turn your face with pure godly meal of fat and oil, that your lips receive goodness. Command that I thrive. Command long life for me with your pure utterance. Bring me away from evil, that through you I may be saved. Ordain for me a destiny of long life. Prolong my days, grant me long life. The seventh day is the biggest day, and it begins with cleaning and new clothes. Likely, you were home cleaning already on the sixth day, both your home and whatever objects of religious devotion you have in your home. The temple servants would have been scrubbing furiously, because today, Marduk will arrive. The cult statues would have new clothes, and so too would all the people, at least freshly laundered, if a whole set of new garments is too expensive for you. This is the day for the largest sacrifices, celebrating the return to the normal order of the world. The forces of darkness and chaos had been defeated by Marduk, and he has been freed from his prison by all the other gods. It's important to note that in other places it wasn't always Marduk who vanished. In Assyria, it's likely the god Asher, and in Ur, Nana was gone, but not fighting in a way that invoked the Enuma Elish, since this was a festival that happened earlier than any of the Babylonian creation myths. Now here it's a good question to ask, what happened to the gods while they were away? Mythically, of course, they were out in the celestial realms somewhere being absent. Physically, however, the cult statues of the most important gods were all physically absent from the city, having spent the last few days inside of a structure somewhere out of town called the Akatu House. Even while these statues were empty vessels, no different from any other constructed things now that the spirit of the gods was absent, they were still treated with reverence at what appears to have been the equivalent of a vacation spa resort for cult statues. Whatever gods are returning, once the greatest prayers and sacrifices have been completed, the gods and men begin to consider the next year, which has now begun properly. Most important in all this was the gods and the king to demonstrate that all is now profoundly right with the world. All the gods were in unanimous agreement on all things, and the king and his ministers showed off how the whole world was stable and prosperous under the king's rule. This likely took the form of feasting and general celebration, for how better to show off prosperity than with a full table? A private individual would want to spend some time in this day to also show reverence for his personal god, and a modern polytheist who only has the resources to celebrate a single day should likely be celebrating on the seventh day, with a dinner, with friends, and with a clean house. Just make sure that the thanksgiving for the gods who make it all possible are not forgotten amid the merrymaking. The eighth day is a day for planning the year ahead. For a small farmer, the harvest is finished, and the budget for the entire coming year needs to be figured out. I've discussed it at length in some previous episodes, but imagine that you only got paid once a year, and had to make sure at that time that you had enough throughout the year to avoid literally starving to death. 
I know for a fact that many modern people that I have met would blow their entire wealth in the first few months and then simply keel over and die when winter came along, even if they had in fact collected enough at the start of the year for the rest of the year. So it's hard for many of us to understand just how solemn and important this day was for families. Among the government, this may have been a day for policy proposals and discussions of the coming year. Among the gods, too, a similar convocation is occurring within the Chamber of Destinies, one that directly parallels the events of the Enuma Elish. All the gods convene, while the mortal king of Babylon oversees the ceremony to honor Marduk. They bow before Marduk upon his throne and confirm that he is the god with all the power to determine destiny. On a macro level, Marduk then rules in favor of the coming year being generally free from horrible events and filled with miscellaneous blessings. Meanwhile, the entire city is spending the day getting along, for superstition informs them that if they speak unkind words, or act in a hostile fashion to anyone, then on this particular day, the good fortune of Marduk will not fall upon their house. For a modern worshipper, is it so hard to go a whole day without speaking any angry or mean words to anyone? The days following this are much more poorly documented, though there are still some things we can say about them. Day 9 saw a great triumphal procession through the city of kings and gods together. For the late period kings, this seems to have been their favorite day, for it was here that they could exit the holy places alongside the great god himself, and be seen by all the people to be touching Marduk, holding his hand, and generally enjoying a personal friendship with the god. This parade, however, is one that must be carefully overseen. Every single event or thing out of place is an omen from the gods, and so great care must be taken to ensure that it goes right, and then anything which does go wrong is properly noted and studied for messages from heaven for the coming year. This was, in fact, generally a great day for divination of all sorts, from checking the livers of sheep to observing the flight of birds, though naturally this entire 12-day Holy Week was filled with people taking divinations for the coming year. The contents of Day 10 are a bit more controversial among scholars. Some people think that it was simply another celebration of Marduk's ultimate victory, with feasting, partying, sacrifices, and prayer. However, there are indications that the ancient and sacred rite of divine marriage also occurred on this day. This is a ritual which goes all the way back to the Sumerian period, and may once have been a separate festival, or perhaps a separate strain of New Year's festivals that got combined with Akitu over the years. But we've been talking about kings being married or having relationships with the goddess Inanna, later named Ishtar, since the very first episode with King Enmerkar at the dawn of writing. Though the literal performance of this ritual is unknown, the king would metaphorically marry the goddess Ishtar, likely engaging in some sort of ritual either with the cult statue or with a priestess of the god. There is a famous erotic poem of the occasion, which is on the website since it's actually too explicit for a nominally family-friendly podcast and would get me kicked off of Apple Podcasts to read in its entirety. But in short, it tells the story of the marriage, with the king taking the role of Dumazid and going through the entire marriage ceremony, including the consummation, rejoicing in every intimate detail. This ritual reinforced the connection between the king and the gods, essentially binding the nation in a marriage alliance with the kings of heaven. After this, day 11 was another council of the gods, this one much more concerned with the intimate details of what would occur throughout the year. Here, the priests would recall through story and prayer the tales of how humanity was created, always emphasizing the serving God aspect of humanity. And once again, divinations would be taken, mostly concerning the details of an individual person's life. Would children come this year? Would the harvest be good? Would disaster strike? 
Questions like that were decided by the gods and communicated through omens and small signs, with the priest receiving generous donations from the crowds of concerned citizens. Though we have little description to give for these events, it must have been a major day of common folks milling around, heading back and forth to get ready for the new year both religiously and in mundane matters. The twelfth day may or may not have been part of the festival, for it's typically described as the day of return to normalcy. The gods who have been wandering from shrine to shrine visiting more important deities are returned to their places, and the business of plowing the fields for the next year begins, no doubt involving a number of quite hungover plowsmen. It's hard to say exactly when the Akatu festival ended historically. We know it took place among the Seleucid Greek rulers, but after around 200 BCE, once the Mesopotamian region became the battleground between Rome and Parthia, many of the older cultural traditions were lost. It seems likely that by the time of Jesus Christ, there was no longer any state-sponsored Akatu festivals, and for sure with the coming of Islam at 600 CE and the stamping out of the final cults of the Sumerian gods, which were mostly just Ishtar by that point, there was no one left to make any attempt to celebrate in the ancient way. However, in recent years and decades, the rediscovery of Mesopotamia has also led to a rekindling of the ancient faith around the world, and Akitu festivals, both small and large, have been organized in some cities in some places around the world. For anyone interested, I have a few links to resources for pagan groups online that might be able to help you out. Those are in the show notes. For the rest of you, though, I hope you've enjoyed this little detour into one of the major regional festivals. Though our focus was on Babylon, variants of this Akitu festival were celebrated throughout the Near East, throughout the Bronze and Early Iron Age. Next episode, we'll return to our regularly scheduled programming, though like I said back at the top of the episode, if you don't see it go out next Wednesday, check back the week after, and we'll be back on the regular schedule for sure. Also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you may have noticed that I don't have many ads, nor do I do much advertising myself. However, if you know anyone who might be interested in this show, either the cultural or historical aspects, or who might just fall in love with my low production values, I would definitely appreciate if you could tell them about the Oldest Stories podcast. Or, if you want, you could leave a review on your podcast app, post on the Facebook, or whatever social media things that kids these days are using in place of human interaction. I do this show for myself because I enjoy it, but it's also gratifying to know that I'm getting what's honestly a pretty obscure but really important story out to so many people nowadays. I say it at the end of every episode, but I want you to know that I really mean it. Thank you for listening. It really means a lot to me.